Hi, welcome to the first of our many lectures. Uh, this is something that we do pretty much every time we have a reading assignment out of the book because I recognize that some people can learn very well from reading while other people need to have more of a description and uh, have more of a, a lecture format, although this really isn't a lecture because it's not interactive, you don't get to ask questions, but sometimes it's good to review things and have something that's short that you can go back and look at if you don't understand a concept from the book. I'm going to try to keep these between 10 and 15 minutes, hopefully under 10 minutes for most of them, for the remainder of the this, this semester. And what we're really trying to do here, let me go ahead and get a pen, is that the first job that we have is designing a zoom lens. That's what we're going to do. We're going to use the zoom lens as a model for many other types of optical systems uh, to really understand how they work, how well they create images, what some of the issues of images are, and how to measure how good an optical system works. And that's what we're going to spend the first half of the course on. There are really four things we want to do when we design the zoom lens. And by the way, this is a schematic diagram of the zoom lens down below here is we want to come up with an appropriate conceptual and mathematical model of how light behaves. Because once we have a mathematical model, we can actually make some predictions. That's what engineering is about, uh, building actual systems guided by mathematics rather than intuition. Uh, we want to understand how available devices work that allow the manipulation of light. And we're going to be using lenses and not spend much time on mirrors or prisms or other things. There are certainly a lot of optical devices out there. Um, and we're going to develop a mathematical understanding of those, but not in this lecture. Uh, and then we'll understand what a zoom lens does in terms of the mathematical model and then develop a working model that we can uh, use to make some predictions about whether we can really design a zoom lens that works. Uh, so the basic idea behind this zoom lens is that we have an object, uh, which is the thing that we want to look at over here. It's a real physical thing. And the image is a representation of that can, that can be detected by an eye, that can be detected by film or an electronic imaging device or something like that. And bits of light, photons, if you will, or we often call them, call them rays, and we'll understand the differences in just a minute, come through these lenses and meet over here at the image. But more about that in future lectures. Let's go on and learn some of the basics of light, how light behaves, and sub, what some of the fundamental models are for it. And this is going to be very qualitative rather than quantitative at this point. Um, so some basic concepts and basic models, and we'll get to more of these in the next mini lecture, but this is what we're doing today. Uh, there are three descriptions of light. And the first description is that light behaves as a quantum mechanical particle, a photon, a wavicle, uh, whatever you want to call it. This is a very complex description. The mathematics, if you really want to do this properly, are, are way above and beyond what you need in most cases. It's, it's very complex, but it's always going to be valid. If you do a quantum mechanical description of light, you may not be able to do all the math, and you may not be able to do anything, but your model will be right. And a second model that's the second most complex and works probably in all but 1% of cases uh, for things you'll probably be doing is that light behaves as a wave. You've probably studied some of this in the electromagnetics course, and we're not really going to deal with this that much this semester. There's hopefully going to be another course in the future where we look at the wave properties of light. But what we're going to be doing for the first half of the course, and here's a wave right here, what we're going to be doing for the first half of the course is that we're going to make an assumption that individual particles of light move in straight lines unless they hit a boundary. And this is true, provided that the things they interact with are much, much larger than a wavelength of light. And these wavelengths of light, the, the trough to trough, or peak to peak, or node to node of an electromagnetic wave, are on the order of hundreds of nanometers, or 10 to the minus 6 to 10 to the minus 7 meter range uh, for visible light, the type of light we'll be using in this course. And so that any macroscopic object is much, much larger than a wavelength. And so for dealing with macroscopic objects, things that we can handle in our hands, um, the approximation that individual particles of light move in straight lines is very, very valid. And a boundary is defined to be a change in the index of refraction of a material. And we'll get to that in a minute. But an important thing that we're doing is this is often called the ray model of light or the geometric optics model of light because we're working with geometry, how rays and lines interact. It really, things really become geometrical problems in this case. And when we talk about a piece of light, we call it a ray. And just like in geometry, a ray is a mathematically ideal object. It's a perfectly straight line without beginning or end um, that we can do mathematical operations on. 
Now, to the index of refraction. The index of refraction is one of the most fundamental properties of, of materials. It's essentially the speed of light in vacuum divided by the speed of light in the material, because going through practically any material, light goes more slowly than it does in a vacuum. And so that, that means this index of refraction is greater than or equal to 1 for all the cases we will be dealing with in this class. It's not strictly true. There are some very special materials that we can create where this is not true, uh, very special cases where this is not true. But for everything we're going to be dealing with in this class, the index of refraction is a property of the material that just says how slow the light goes when it interacts with the material. And the index of refraction is always greater than 1, meaning the, the light slows down as it enters the material. The higher the index of refraction, the slower the light goes. So two laws to begin with. These are two basic rules. And so what we have here is, first of all, is the law of reflection. And in this law of reflection, these lines, which you'll see a lot, that stick out vertically from surfaces are normals to the surface. In other words, there's a 90 degree angle between this line and the surface. Uh, normal to a surface, it's perpendicular to the surface, whatever you want to call it. And these arrows you see right here are rays of light. This is this, this piece of light coming in, making a perfectly straight line until it interacts with the surface. Uh, we treat this as a geometrical object. It's an idealization of light. Light really isn't arrows. It's, it's, I'm not really sure what it is, but it isn't arrows. And the law of reflection says that the angle of the incident ray from the normal, theta 1, right there, is equal to the reflected ray, theta 2, right there. So that if light comes in at a 45-degree angle, made normal to the surface, it will leave at a 45-degree angle, made normal to the surface. Pretty straightforward. Another law, the second one, is called Snell's Law. This one's a little bit more complicated. This says if you have a material with index of refraction in 1 here and a different index of refraction in 2 down here, they're both transparent so light can go through them, that the relationship between the angle of the normal to the surface on the input side, in material in 1 or with index in 1, and the angle on the output side of the boundary, uh, theta 2, is related by Snell's law. And that's proportional to the signs of the angles and the indices of refraction. So let's take a look at what, what that looks like, because I've got a Java app that I can hopefully call up here, if things will work properly. And there we go. OK. So what we're seeing here is a Java applet. This is linked in your reading assignment. You can find this at the site you see here. And essentially what Snell's law says, and let's go ahead, I don't think I can write on this unfortunately, is that the relation between the angles on both sides depends both on the incident angle by, by the sign of the incident angle and the index of refraction. So on material 1 here, I'm going to take in the index of refraction to 1, which is to a very good proxim approximation of the index of refraction of air. Here, the darker material, and the darker the material is, the higher the higher the index of refraction, at least in this Java app, but this can be a perfectly transparent material. It doesn't really get darker if it has, has a high index, but that's how you see the differences. You'll notice this incident angle is fairly big, and the angle coming out is quite a bit smaller. As we increase that, the angle over here increases, but not nearly as fast as this other angle. As I were to lower the index of refraction, the angle gets bigger, as I increase the index of refraction, the angle gets smaller. And that's all from Snell's law right there. Again, if we increase the index of refraction over here, this angle gets larger because the, it isn't the index of refraction that determines the difference in the angles. It's the ratio of the indices of refraction. So let's go back and take a look at this real quick. 